A while back, a bunch of people at work decided that they were going to start up a Finer Things Club, where they would get together and discuss art and 19th century literature and the break room over lunch and eat little triangle cut cucumber sandwiches and want it in. I don't know a lot about that stuff, but I'm always trying to be much fancier. And so I started reading 19th century literature and learning a lot. And there was one book in particular that I really latched on to. And it is this one, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Fascinating story. And I thought, surely this will be my ticket into the Finer Things Club. So I brought it up with a few of the members. And eventually it was explained to me that they were picturing something more like this about the 19th century English socialites. So whatever. I never made it into the group, but jokes on them because this book is awesome and legitimately I am recommending it to you. It's cool because it's old school horror, not like gross slasher, bloody disgusting horror. It's brain horror, thriller kind of content from way back in the day. So it gives you a sense of how that genre has evolved, but it's also found footage fiction which became popular again with the Blair Witch Project. You remember that? It's like, oh, there's a camera. We found it. Let's see what's on there. Oh, no, this is really scary, and it's all real. So this guy did. He created letters, correspondence, official reports, and some straightforward narrative to tell this story in a really groundbreaking way. There's a reason it's a classic. Check it out. Here's my point, though. This book... I know exactly where it came from. A guy sat down and wrote it with a pen. He had ideas. He got input from people. There was an editor. Eventually, it went to press. But the best-selling book of all time, which is still this one, claims to have an entirely different process behind it. It claims to not be entirely man-made and that there's a deity behind it somehow. Now, look, that raises a ton of questions about what that writing and editorial process must have looked like. In this video, I can't get into all of those questions, but I just want to deal with the most basic question, which is, is the Bible from God? And if so, how? In order to answer that question, you have to explore two possibilities. One, no, it's not from God. Two, yes, it is from God, but what exactly does that mean? So blah, 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 read Bram Stoker's Dracula. We're going to talk about the Bible on Matt's 10-Minute Bible Hour. Here we go. I don't know if I did this justice in that intro I just did, but this is a ridiculously difficult, important question, right? A, a crap ton about who we are and how we live and how things work out hinges on whether or not we think God is behind the Bible. So in order for us to think about it fairly, I really think we need to evaluate it from both possibilities. No, it's not from God. And yes, it is from God. And then what does that mean? So let's start with no. If you give the answer, no, the Bible isn't from God, then I think there's another question you got to answer, which is, well, then what is it? Where did it come from? Obviously, it's a cultural phenomenon that's unrivaled in proportion. How did that happen? How do people fall for it? Here are some possibilities. One, it's a legend that just got out of control. People heard rumors about this guy doing crazy stuff in the ancient Near East and kind of blew up into more and more. And then people exaggerated and wrote down bigger exaggerations. And everybody was eventually like, I got Jesus fever. Those exaggerations are my favorite exaggerations. I want to believe in this lie that I tell myself. I, it could be. Even Christians would say that that is the explanation for how probably most other religions happened. So it's at least worth considering that that's where we come from. But there are a couple problems here that make this one tricky. One, you already had a robust cosmology of gods in the Greco-Roman world at this point. And people had serious money in that stuff. I mean, the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus was a ludicrously expensive endeavor. And Artemis being real was really good for business in Ephesus. And that wasn't the only town that had a patron god or goddess. People had huge sunk cost in this existing cosmology, and it's pretty weird to think that a new one would come along, especially from somewhere unfashionable like Galilee and Judea, and displace the whole thing just like that in one generation. Another problem with this is the idea that legends generally happen a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, not like within living memory of the recorded events. The Bible 
is writing down stuff that people could still go and investigate for themselves with living witnesses. So if somebody came along today and was like, hey, remember that time that Ronald Reagan got shot by Gene Simmons of KISS? Everybody would be like, what? Like Gene Simmons is a pretty memorable face. I think I would... I think I would have that up here still if that's who shot Ronald Reagan. No, you're making stuff up. I'm not falling for that one. Like We would dismiss it because it's recent news. Well, these legends were just too recent chronologically to get that kind of momentum, especially enough momentum to displace existing legends that were already really cemented. A second possibility, and this is the one you will hear probably the most. The Bible represents a clever move on the part of powerful people to invent a religion and subjugate and control people out of fear of this invented deity. Okay, again, almost all religious people might be tempted to say this about all other religions, so it's not an argument that religious people just reject outright. We just reject it for our own religion. Let's see if it holds up in the case of Christianity. On the one hand, you do have a history of enormous political power being headquartered in Rome and operating out of the church. So yeah, there was power to be had and the stakes were high. But again, the chronology just doesn't line up. There wasn't really power to be had until around 315 AD if you were a Christian. Prior to that, you were far more likely to be persecuted for being a Christian. Christianity wasn't even a tolerated religion until the early 4th century, and it wasn't the official religion until the late 4th century in the Roman Empire, which means that like the amount of time that has passed between now and the founding fathers and revolutionary war in the Americas is how much time passed in there. A lot of stuff has happened in that time, and a lot of stuff would have happened in the unfolding of Christianity and politics. But for the most part, this was a thing for outsiders and the weak. Christians did a lot of losing in the early going, and no one who wanted power would have tried to ride on the back of Christianity to get it in the early days when the Bible was being written. So has the church abused power? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like most religions. But that is an after-the-fact result of how they interacted with the Bible, not really a valid explanation for where the Bible came from in the first place in its original writings. Another possibility is that what you've got in the ancient world is the first cosmopolitan environment where because of the conquests of Alexander and the legacy of the Persians and the work of the Romans, you got all the ideas mushing together for the first time ever, a great melting pot of ideas. And Christianity and the Bible are representative then of a synthesis of all of the best ideas from all of this global culture. And it was only a matter of time until some organized system of thought or religion did this. Supporting this view would be that John seems to draw heavily on the thought of Plato, that there's an acknowledgement of Jewish and non-Jewish audience members on behalf of the people who wrote the Bible. Could be. But the weakness of this is that all of the ideas that are put together form something that really is pretty cohesive and that seems to flow pretty naturally out of the Old Testament, which was written at a time that predates all of this cosmopolitan moment in the ancient Near East. So it is a synthesis, but I'm not sure that that works as a singular explanation for where a not inspired by God Bible would have come from. I wrote down notes, so I'm looking down here to remember what I was going to say. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Another take that you'll hear as to where the Bible came from is that it's not from God and the confusion comes from the fact that it looks like it was written much earlier, but these were actually all fake writings from authors posing as first century authors, but writing hundreds of years after the fact, again, presumably to prop up some kind of power structure. This is one of those arguments that you hear repeated a lot, but it's kind of vestigial. In the 19th century, before we had a lot of the manuscript research that has been done recently, to be fair, the earliest manuscripts did seem to be centuries after the fact. 
But with each passing year and archaeological research happening, we keep encountering manuscripts that are closer and closer and closer to the time of Jesus. And so as a result, what 100 years ago seemed like a pretty valid criticism now, eh, the hard data suggests that these authors were writing much closer to the time of Jesus than some would have had you believe a while back. Another possibility is that the New Testament and the Bible in general represents not something inspired by God, but a collection of the most beautiful sayings of the classical world. Like you might get in a coffee table book today and the coffee table book just really, really caught on. Well, you know, there's some validity to that. There's stuff in the New Testament, the teachings of Christ that are transcendent and universal and just inarguably good that if we can strip away the politics and the opinions, theoretically most people would assent to because it's just truth and it's nice. But the problem is there's also a lot of not nice and exclusivity in the Bible. And I know that's a big hang up for people. I get it. But the document pretty clearly indicates that Jesus is like the centerpiece of human hope and human salvation. And so the it is a collection of beautiful thoughts from the first century doesn't really hold up because you can't ignore the fact that there are exclusive claims about the deity and importance of Christ. Okay, if it seems like I'm just setting up straw men and knocking them over really easily and casually right now, um, I'm sorry. Again, I'm biased. I think the Bible is from God. So I'm doing my best, but you got to take into account that I'm coming from an angle here. That said, here is what I think is the strongest possible explanation for what the Bible is if it wasn't inspired. And that would be that well-intentioned people who believed they saw something and believed they were telling the truth, wrote stuff down as best as they could, ordered it into a system of thought, their credibility was born out of their certainty of what they thought they had seen in the life of Jesus, in what they thought were miracles. And because they were so convinced by this misconception that they went to their graves, dying violently in support and refusing to renounce these claims, a lot of other people looked at that martyrdom and were really moved by it. A lot of people are suckers for martyrs even today. And so this blood of the martyrs watered the tree of Christian faith, and it grew up quickly and into something that couldn't be contained or controlled. Well-intentioned, honest misperception. The strength of this argument is that we all know people who are obviously wrong about something they're claiming, but they really, really believe it, and they're not bad people, and we don't have to impugn them because we can see that they have integrity, they're just wrong. In not support of this position, though, is that we're not talking about one or two things that they claim to have seen that happened in private, or one or two words that they claim to have heard from Jesus that happened in private. This whole thing went down wildly publicly, and a whole lot of people would have had to have misperceived the same stuff again and again and again over the course of three years with Jesus, and then over the course of decades in the early church, in order for them to have all got this wrong at once. I think I just said chuluj. I don't actually know what that was, but I think you get the point. Here's the deal. The idea that the Bible exists but is not inspired by God is obviously one that a lot of people hold, and there are reasons for this. But just as the honest skeptic can look at some of the reasons that people express for having faith and say, yeah, some of that's not quite as convincing as others, so I think that same honest skeptic can look at some of the social explanations for the Bible and say, some of those have more merit, some of those honestly, are pretty weak arguments. And before I talk about the flip side of this, let me just point out that there are other books that claim in one way or another to be from God, inspired by God. And in some other video, we need to just go through and break down what those claims look like in those other books to see how this all shakes out. Here, I only have time to talk about the Bible, so we'll just work with that. Okay, so if one assumes that God is not behind the Bible— Obviously, that does raise a whole lot of other questions, and we kicked that around a little bit just now. In the next video, I'm going to consider some of the questions that come up when we assume that God is behind the Bible. How did he do that? 
What does that process even look like? There are a whole lot of different ideas about it and it'll be fun to discuss that together. So I'm gonna go do some calisthenics and practice nunchucks to get loose and keep my brain sharp for the next half of this episode. And we'll see you on the other side. I'm Matt, this is 10 Minute Bible Hour. Catch you in a minute. I bought these nunchucks for $14 from a beach store in Florida and I've been kind of practicing them. They also carry throwing stars and flotation devices and flip flops. So I know it's pretty legitimate. Basically, if you come into my office without warning and I don't know you're coming and I just grab these and start swinging, you might be dead before I realize you weren't a threat. So tread carefully, my friend. All right, on to part two. 